Welcome everybody to another episode of the Can Mayonnaise Kill a Jedi podcast. I am your main host, the Artificial Dragon. I'm your co-host, Darth Selene. And welcome to episode 47 of the podcast, everybody. Uh, by the time this episode is recording, it is October 1st, and we all know Happy what... Happy spooky season! <laughs> it is the month of Hollow's Eve, everybody. Uh, we're not exactly doing a super spoopy episode this time. Well, unless you count uh, kidnapping children as spoopy, but yeah. <laughs> um, but don't worry, everybody. We will be doing a Halloween-themed episode in the next couple of weeks, I can assure you. I'll wear my costume. I'm sure I already you got will. my costume. Nice. I'm looking forward to that. It's nothing special. It was just a fucking 10 buck costume I got <laughs> at fucking Walmart. <laughs> I couldn't find a maid costume because, you know, I clean houses. Yeah. But I decided to go with a nun. Um, because of the, uh, the, the horror movie of the same name, I assume? No, it just... I decided how ironic would it be for me, an atheist or a pagan, to be wearing a nun's outfit. That would be super ironic, Hannah. Yeah. I am not too sure what I'm going to be dressing up as. I guess a uh, <laughs> a depressed adult will have to do. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, spoopy real life things aside. Uh, yeah, welcome to the 47th episode of the podcast, everybody. Let me go ahead and go through the Patreon stuff real quickly. Um, if you guys enjoyed our podcast or any of the content that we make, such as our Star Wars alternate D&D stuff, we have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash canmail. Once again, it's patreon.com slash canmail, where if you contribute to any amount, the lowest being $3, which is our initiate, uh, $5, which I believe is the spacer tier, or $10 for the smugglers tier. Any tier that you contribute to, you have instant access to our Discord server, where you could talk about general Star Wars lore, share memes, give us topic suggestions, or share your NPCs, or OCs, something like that, or just It's always vibe fun with listening us. to uh, people's ideas for topics, and listening to their ideas for uh ocs yeah yeah the uh what was it and, Man hear and hearing feedback that uh, yeah feedback is always appreciated everybody it gives us a nice little uh i guess future insight of what our episodes are going to be in the near future of course uh <laughs> we'll get to your topics when we get to them but yeah just know that we'll take priority over your guys's topics mm -hmm. but uh, yeah um, so for this month, for Hallow's Eve, I do have a very special uh, Patreon art piece. Um, this is something that Hannah is reacting to to the very first time. But Again. <laughs> but Sorry. given that this is... Uh, okay. Um, given that this is Hallow's Eve, I'm going to do something new. This will be our very first Monster Girl. And it is a Yuzhen Vong Warrior. Oh, okay. <laughs> that underwhelming reaction over there, Hannah. I didn't really find the Yuzhen Wang interesting, so that's... <laughs> it's just, it, it's cool, I guess. It is very cool. She's got a very dominatrix-looking pose there. Yes. About she to whip you. She does not have a nose. No, she does not, as all Yuzhen Vong don't have a nose. But anyway, yeah, she's going to whip you into shape with her nice little uh, amphi staff over there, or she'll step on you like many other people will want their waifus to do. But yeah, happy Hollows Eve, everybody. I hope you enjoy the art piece. And I'll give a quick shout out to all the smugglers that uh, have contributed to our podcast. We got a lot more than usual. Um, so I'll go straight to the point. Uh, thank you to Cameron Lee, Dr. Emboss, uh, Eric, no, Kenneth Young, Leon Fought the Fourth, Tristan H., and finally, after so many months, Irk the Turtle has joined the Smugglers Yay! tier. And last but not least, thank you to VoxCast to Nowhere, our follow a, a fellow podcaster who has contributed to our Patreon. Thank you, everybody, so much for supporting us for the past couple months. Uh, thank you, especially Irk the Turtle, who has been on the lowest tier for the longest time and has now joined the ranks of the smugglers. Yay! Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for supporting our podcast, and we look forward to the new members that uh, want to join our nice little family of uh, people who are obsessed 
with the answer of, can man I steal a Jedi? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, with that aside, Hannah, oh yeah, um, shout outs for your blog. <laughs> yep, support my blog. Send me asks. Oh, so far only Irk, Irk the Turtle and you, Isaac, have sent asks. Yes, so. I have. And you are yet to answer the birthday question. Yes, I will. <laughs> but to everybody else, please send me asks. It's just, it would help. Help my motivation. <laughs> it's just give, me, a, give me something else to focus on other than my dad. Oh, well, okay. That was a little downer episode there. But Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, with that aside, Hannah, you obviously know what today's topic is going to be about. Mm-hmm. And today, everyone, we will be talking about the different organizations within the Jedi Order itself. Nice. We did a uh, kind of similar episode a year ago, I believe. Yeah, a year ago, um, where we talked about different force-using organizations. Like, uh, there was the... Well, okay, we mentioned the Great Paladins before, who are basically Jedi that use guns and everything. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, we will be focusing on the organization, different organizations of the Jedi. Because, as... Like, uh, very similar to our uh, Bounty Hunters Guild episode, there are different factions, different sects of a Jedi over the millennia and everything. Yep. And, uh, yeah, we will be exploring these different organizations. And do not worry, Hannah. We will be talking about the Karelian Jedi in this episode. Just a slight heads up. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah, let me go ahead and get started with the list from... Uh, <laughs> an alphabetical order, okay. let's just say. So, give me a minute. Mm. He needs to get a drink. Yeah, I, yeah I, uh, I need to hydrate myself because ooh, this is going to be a lot of big words to I'm talk sure about. <laughs> but yeah, um, so the, Je the first Jedi organization I will be talking about. <laughs> the fuck? Do you need help over there, Hannah? <laughs> Struggling to open a bottle of soda, what the fuck? <laughs> What the fuck? Help me, please. <laughs> yes, you need the powerful man hands to rescue you. I can't get it. That was sealed really tight. There <laughs> Thank we you. go. The galaxy is once again saved. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, Hannah. I need my diet sustenance. Your diet sustenance indeed. Gobble, gobble. All right, you got your your uh, throat hydrated over there. <laughs> so, let me go ahead and start with our first organization called the Agents of Osis. Okay. So, the Agents of Osis are a secretive group of Force users formed during the ascendancy of a galactic empire. So, essentially, these guys were formed during Order 66 and the shitstorm that came with that. Well... Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was founded by this guy named Jin Lo Rias, a former Padawan and survivor of said Order 66. Um, he would escape the Jedi Temple when Darth Vader, you know, just ransacked it with a 501st yep. Legion and everything. Um, everyone and he, knows about Order 66. Yeah. If you every, don't, you're living under a fucking rock. Everybody and their grandmother knows about Order 66. Um... But yeah, Viz Padawan, he would retreat to the core world of Shandrilla. Shandrilla is the home world of Mon, Mon Mothma, Mothma. Yeah. Um, and hope to find more survivors of a Jedi Purge. Though to his dismay, he could only find untrained Force users instead of fully trained Jedi Knights or Padawans like he was. Yeah. Um, Undeterred, though, he formed these new adepts into secret cells across the core by training them in the basic tenets of a force. Um, he named this organization the Agents of Asis after the Jedi's previous homeworld as they were meant to retain the lore of the Jedi Order during the dark times of the Empire and everything. Mm -hmm. um, Keeping, keeping of the uh, tenants safe from persecution of the Empire, in order to blend in, they eschewed the lightsaber as a main weapon. Like, yeah, lightsaber, it's kind of hard to miss in the Age of the Empire. Yeah, um, no shit. <laughs> and instead, they utilized more <laughs> ambiquitous weapons, such as blasters and vibro weapons. Very simple, very straight to the point. They're just secret keepers of knowledge in the Age of the Empire. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah. And the next 
uh, sect of Jedi are kind of interesting. You you might find these guys interesting. Mm -hmm. They are called the Altizian Jedi. Every single time I look at Altizian, I, for some reason, read it as uh, <laughs> Autistic Jedi. <laughs> for some fucking reason. Probably because I'm it's autistic. It's what your eyes read. Yeah. Yeah, I swear to God, I am not uh, dyslexic or anything like that. It just <laughs> read it for... My brain read it out as autistic instead of autistic. Autisian? Sorry, Autisian. Um, the Autisian Jedi are a unique splinter faction of a Jedi Order founded by Jedi Master Jin Autis and were very controversial as they held more unorthodox views of a Jedi Code, such as a Master having multiple apprentices to train. Okay. So, uh, yeah, like in the main Jedi Order, like there's always one Padawan that a Jedi Master trains. He doesn't take up multiple apprentices or anything like that. But these guys take multiple apprentices. Well, technically, uh, in Exarchoon's time, they had uh, multiple apprentices. Well, I mean, yeah, in the ancient, the ancient Jedi, yes, but you get what I mean. Yes, I get, <laughs> I get what you mean. Yeah. Um, they even allowed families and even possessed members of non-Force-sensitive individuals. See, fucking Jedi Order, <laughs> you can do it! <laughs> it's also kind of interesting because uh, Altis and his members um, embodied some aspects of the old Jedi Order, such as uh, serving as more of relief workers to underdeveloped worlds across the galaxy and mm -hmm. everything like that, instead of just focusing on the core and listening to the whims of a galactic senate like the Jedi do in the prequel era and mm -hmm. all that. Like, here's a quote from the Jedi Jin Altis himself. I teach being good, doing good, and asking good questions. That's about it, really. Wow. Yeah. Um, however, even though they were kind of allowed to exist, member during the Clone Wars, they began working more closely with the High Council because, you know, there's a motherfucking Count Dooku they have to worry about and everything. Well, yeah. Um, and they started undertaking missions and scoring victories against the Confederacy. Interestingly enough, we all know Ahsoka is one of the more compassionate members of a Jedi Order. Yep. Um, Ahsoka Tano encountered these guys, and she was disturbed by their more or unorthodox practices. Mm -hmm. Because she saw these guys as a bunch of weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let me see. They even had a, uh, you know, the planet Bespin? I've heard of it, don't really know. Okay, it. you know where, what uh, Cloud City is, right? Oh, right. Yeah, that's the uh, gas giant that Cloud City is hovering above. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they have an enclave above Bespin, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, you know, they keep on working alongside the Jedi Order. During Order 66, the Altizian Jedi would go underground and try setting up escape routes for members of the Jedi Order and their allies. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they're pretty simple. Just a bunch of weirdo gypsy Jedi who allow familial ties and everything like that and adopt people who aren't powerful in the Force. Hey, non-powerful non Force users need somewhere to go. Exactly. You gotta be there for family. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the next one... Um, this is probably one of the more important organizations of a Jedi Order in its ancient past and everything. Um, you may have heard this before. It is called the Army of Light. Army of Light. I have um, not heard this. Okay. The Army of Light is an army created near the end of a new Sith Wars. It was basically a light side counter to the Sith's Brotherhood of Darkness. Hmm. Which is, if you recall, the organization that Darth Bane extincted into oblivion. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, the, the Order, the Army of Light, think of it as like a more militaristic, feudal era, Jedi-led army. So, samurais. Pretty much, yeah. Or okay. like, um... <laughs> uh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> knights during the Crusades and all that. Okay. Um, it, the, the Army of Light was founded by this Jedi Master named Lord Hoff. Not to be confused with a planet Hoff. Mm -hmm. um, the Army of Light was a Odhuk military force hastily assembled to combat the unified Sith. It was made up of many baronaries and warships of multiple Jedi Lords. And the Jedi Lords are basically feudal lords. They ruled over their own separate planets, like, you know, feudal lords in Japan and everything like that. 
Interesting. Yeah, these guys are kind of uh, extreme because they would supply their own force-sensitive and non-force-sensitive soldiers into the war effort. Like, in it was it's kind of a uh, very extreme yet under uh, practical strategy because they want to deprive the uh, the Brotherhood of Darkness and their force-sensitive members. So they just straight up abduct children from a planet that they invade. Jesus Christ! Well, yeah. the Jedi do it too. So. <laughs> yeah, the 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 <laughs> army of lies like, oh, you're about to abduct that four sets of children, are you? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the new uh, Sith Wars was basically uh, extremist Jedi against str- extremist Sith and everything like that. It was God. just the dark ages at this point. Um, Why do you think I like the Old Republic so much yeah, better? Yeah, the Old Republic is so fascinating in all honesty. It is. <laughs> but yeah, um, by the time the Brotherhood of Darkness became extinct by the machinations of Darth Bane through the Thought Bomb, mm-hmm. the Army of Light would retire their Jedi Lords as the war finally came to a close. Though many Jedi Lords would keep their power for many decades and would mend the wounds their war had caused on their own worlds and everything like that. So it kind of slowly transitioned into the golden age of a Republic and everything like mm-hmm. that. It was, it's just kind of fascinating that at one point the Jedi were basically transformed into traditional samurai. Mm-hmm. And then the, and then their common enemy, the Sith, Sith went extinct. And they're like, eh, time to go back into peacetime, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, the Army of Light is... We'll probably go more into the Army of Light when we talk about uh, Darth Bane. Because I'm just barely scratching the surface with the Army of Light. I'm sure. And Lord Hoff in general. Because they are fascinating aspects of the new Sith Wars. But we'll save that for... Their episode and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Now, next. This one is actually pretty interesting because they're technically not part of the Jedi Order, but they work very closely with the Jedi Order. And these guys are called the Anterian Rangers. And they're basically an organization of non-Force users that work as uh, a supportive group to the Jedi Order and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And I'll send a picture of these guys to you. Oh, wow, there's a picture. Yeah, there is actually pictures, yes. Okay. Yeah, they're okay. just, uh, they're normal as dudes, but the Anterian Rangers are a security force established to assist the Jedi Order and eventually the new Jedi Order by Luke Skywalker. Okay. Um, they were founded in 620 years before the Battle of Yavin, so... Basically, 380 years after the extinction of the Sith, Mm -hmm. quote-unquote. The Anterian Rangers are a unique, non-Force-sensitive organization that, unlike a majority of citizens of the galaxy, they do not fear the supernatural abilities of a Jedi Order and seek to assist them in any way they can. Mm -hmm. So, what's a good comparison I could think of? They're like uh, assistant workers, like a... Uh, maybe like the kind of like the Red Cross is with the U.S. Army and everything. So like the Red Cross or the Salvation Army. Yeah, pretty much. Um, they serve many roles from reconnaissance duty to covert operations. Their presence making a Jedi's job that much easier, meaning they usually do the dirty work for their Jedi comrades. Like these guys, uh, they're pretty much normal as dudes. Um. Let's, I'll be completely honest. A Jedi wearing a robe and a casually walking around with a lightsaber around their belt? Kind of hard to miss. Well, no fucking shit. These guys help the, the Jedi's job, you know, committing to undercover operations that much easier for them. That's cool. Yeah. It's like Jedi intelligence almost. Pretty much. Um, here's a quote on what it means to be an Altarian Ranger. To be a Ranger meant knowing how to move in any environment... To blend in with a forest or grassland. To sail, to swim, to dive, to pilot. To the masters of our surroundings. We were good spies. Good warriors. Very adept at intrusion and escape. Yeah, so basically Imperial intelligence, but For the Jedi, Jedi, yes, pretty much. Um, But yeah, um, let's see. Uh, crap. Uh, the the Rangers were meant to attract members of society that want to help the Jedi Order, but they themselves are not Force-sensitive. So, 
kind of very if you're <laughs> so we talked about in the Jedi Temple episode how there's temple security and everything like yeah. that. Like they're normal as dudes, mm-hmm. but you want to be much more proactively assisting the Jedi instead of providing security to their base of operations or every anything like that. You yeah. go into the field with them. That's where the uh, Tyrion Rangers come in. Okay. Um, but let me see. As most members within the organization rarely co- coveted the rank of ranger. Um, like, if they don't want to be on the field, so to speak, they have other roles, such as providing uh, field maintenance. They want to be a pilot, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, every single member that joins the Altarian Rangers are valued within the organization. Like, everybody is doing something. They're just not there for show. They're always, they always have a job to do. That's cool. At the height of its power, the Altarian Rangers ranged at around a thousand members. They're as diverse as the Jedi Order itself. Wow. So yeah, they're, and not to say that the job of an Altarian Ranger is easy. They have to go through numerous training exercises and combat activities and field operations and everything like that. Mm-hmm. It's almost like uh, training to be an Altarian Ranger is almost comparable to uh, being a Green Beret. Yeah, like Special Forces. Yeah, Makes pretty sense. much. Yeah, um... And uh, most of the times, Altarian Rangers become semi-permanent companions to an individual Jedi they work with the most. Like, a lot of companion characters in Swator. Think of them almost like that. Okay. Yeah. V- each Altarian Ranger has their own skills. Like, one of them could be a great sniper. Another could be a spy. Another could be a uh, down-and-dirty brawler. That sort of thing. They have their own Unique specialities that the Jedi would find useful in their next mission. But yeah, a relationship between a Jedi and Ranger is almost akin to a Master and Padawan, where the Ranger would have to assist the Jedi as their aid of sorts. Mm -hmm. In some cases, this bond could run much deeper, to a point where a Jedi would develop emotional attachments to the Rangers. Oh, God forbid. (laughs) Yeah, and there's even cases of... Jedi, uh, members of a Jedi Order and Tyrion Rangers, uh, becoming married. Shit happens. Yeah, shit happens. You know, a lot of things happen when you're off the field. It's just like how that, was it a clone impregnated in <laughs> yep, I remember, I'm a motherfucking Republic Commando, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I always remember that being a controversial topic. But yeah. <laughs> but anything could happen. Anything could happen, Yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, okay. I'll go ahead and... While it is a technically a paramilitary organization, they would never afford losses, even at the height of their membership. Um, retirement or discharge from injury are qualifying grounds for leaving the Altarian Rangers, Mm -hmm. as trying to depart without good reason is basically grounds for desertion, so pretty classic military stuff. That sucks. Yeah. It's just like you decide you're done. It's like, nope, you're not done until either you get hurt or you get <laughs> old. Though, if a member is dead set on <clears throat> leaving the Rangers, um, they would not stop that individual because, well, it's their choice. If you want to leave, then you could go. But you got to provide a good fucking reason Pretty for much, it. yeah. That's um, so dumb. <laughs> Though, considering that the Rangers work alongside the Jedi and are privy to their secret activities, there are certain steps to that are needed to ensure that the member doesn't spill the beans, so to speak. Well, duh. So it's pretty understandable why they would be uh, strict about leaving the organization in that yeah. fashion. Just like if they say a... Uh... Imperial intelligence agent decided to leave. Yeah. It's like, either you're going to get brain wiped or you're not going to be allowed to leave. Yeah, or just straight out assassination. (laughs) In the rare case that a ranger leaves to become a member of a Jedi Order, it was considered a massive honor. And there would be a ceremony held by all members as a final farewell to their chosen compatriot. Hmm. So yeah, apparently there could be a young member of the Altarian Rangers that is force sensitive and the Jedi are like, you, uh, we want you to join our organization. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting of how close of a connection the Altarian Rangers have with the Jedi Order. That's pretty cool. Um, with, okay. Um, 
Also kind of interesting, within the group, the Rangers always kept an eye out on members misusing their power in conducting evil acts, thus being able to separate them from the organization much of the same way the Jedi does the same thing with members that lean too closely to the dark side of the Force. Mm. But yeah, um, even though the, the Altarian Rangers are a pretty useful asset, the Jedi High Council as a whole are pretty much indifferent to the Rangers. Like, they don't have a low opinion of them. They don't have a high it's opinion like they just, of them. It's like, eh, they do what they want. Yeah, it's pretty much, eh. They're, they're there. Who cares? They're not bothering anybody. They're useful, whatever. That's funny. But yeah, it's kind of different for each member of a Jedi Order as a whole. Because either A, they highly value their skills on the field because, well, they might be more closely connected to the regular people than a normal Jedi does. So mm -hmm. they got that going for them. Um, but yeah, ironically enough, uh, even though they are close to the Jedi Order, they don't, uh, they aren't scrutinized by a majority of the galaxy who heavily scrutinize the Jedi Order itself for being a heavily armed organization that works closely with the government and everything like yeah. that. But yeah, um, even though they weren't scrutinized by the general public, uh, I'll actually go to that in a little bit. During the Clone Wars, the Jedi would become much more militarized and members of the Altarian Rangers pretty much retired because they didn't want to deal with this shit and feel useless. Yeah. Others uh, decided to become mercenaries and others took military authority positions within the Grand Army of the Republic. Mm -hmm. Um... However, during Order 66, even though the Altarian Rangers aren't a force-using organization, they are seen as equal targets. Allies of the Jedi. Allies of the Jedi and, uh, yeah, grounds for execution by the Galactic Empire. Oof. So, yeah. It's all like, oh, shit, you're an Altarian Ranger. Wait, but I'm not force-sensitive. Too bad! <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, um... Yeah, the Atarian Rangers, they pretty much went underground during Order 66, forming their own resistance movements or just, you know, just carrying on their own lives, not to be persecuted by the Empire. Mm -hmm. And then Luke Skywalker's uh, Jedi Order came along and they had a nice little revive. That's cool. Serving the Jedi Order in a completely different incarnation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, next... Uh, the true meat of the episode that you're excited for, we will be talking about the Corellian Jedi. Otherwise known as the Green Jedi. Yay, the Green Jedi, because, you know, they, they wear, wear the green, green robes. <laughs> very, very obvious, very simple name. Um, but yeah, the, the Green Jedi are basically a more reclusive sect of the Jedi Order that live in the Corellia sector. Very self-explanatory. Well, no shit. <laughs> they are known for their highly independent nature and are... Obviously, you've you've uh, experienced them the you most. You encounter them fucking everywhere on Corellia. I'm pretty sure you pretty much extinct them into oblivion as a, as a uh, Sith warrior, was it? I think it's Sith warrior. Okay, Because you yeah. don't really encounter them much with the uh, Inquisitor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they held the protection of Corellia over the well-being of a Republic itself. And we, they would butt heads constantly with their traditional Jedi counterparts. Also, really quick, side tangent about Corellia. The fucking map in the game... <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> it is a maze, and I fucking hate it. <laughs> and here I find uh, Ilum and Hoff were the most hated maps for I you. I don't like those either. <laughs> but Corellia is fucking worse. Yeah, I, I it's imagine a giant it would. maze. Yeah, yeah. Um, the origins of the Green Jedi are pretty simple. Let's be honest. The Green Jedi were originally founded when several Corellian Jedi created a small schism within the Jedi Order and said, "Fuck you, Dad. We're going to make our own sect in Corellia and protect its interests in several republics." Um, they created their own enclave within Coronet City, which is the capital of Corellia and all that. Yes. Um. They would only take missions within their, their own home sector, developing their own customs, such as, you know, adopting the green uniforms um, in honor of a Corellian flag. And past Jedi credits, which are basically decorative tokens, which are awarded to knights that were 
affiliated to Jedi Masters. Okay. And those tokens would be passed on to their masters and their family and friends. Mm -hmm. So, you know how, like, in a ceremony um, or, like, a uh, graduation ceremony, you're given, like, a, uh, a, uh, I don't know, a graduation paper. Your diploma. Your diploma and all that. You graduated recently. How do you not remember? I forget a lot of things. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But, yeah. Um, where was I? Okay. Um, graduation. They even permitted marriages and encouraged long legacies and bloodlines with the most famous example of a Jedi bloodline within the Karelian Jedi being the Halcyon family. Oh. Yeah. Um, the Halcyon family is, doesn't mean too much to you, but they're like a uh, major bloodline within the old EU of Star Wars. The only thing like Halcyon I know is the... Uh cruise ship that's getting oh, shut down oh yeah 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 i remember that yeah <laughs> yeah it was only open for like a year and they're shutting <laughs> it down that sucks yeah yeah but anyway back from the halcyon into the Corellian jedi sorry um yeah um they even have close re they even have a close relationship with the Corellian security forces so corsac. these yes they do of course <laughs> um and they would aid them in the capture of local criminals and smugglers. The Karelian Jedi are so different that the Jedi High Council are highly suspicious of them and, and saw them as bordering on heretical to the Jedi path. <laughs> so yeah, these guys Hypocrites. are... Yeah, they're... Yeah, uh, yes, the Jedi Council is pretty hypocritical, but it's kind of funny that they see these guys as the true rebels. Very Corellian of these guys. Yeah, they're very Corellian. Yeah, very Corellian. It's very, very smug. Their independence is overwhelming, even though I live in America right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, where was I? Okay. Among yeah, the Corellians are more independent than America is. Yeah, you know, that's fair. You know, that's fair. Um, among the criminal underworld, the Corellian Jedi have a reputation as a cold and unearing sense of, of duty, which does not make them friendly nor present to those they deal with. Oof. That so, sucks. So for the criminals, they basically see the Corellian Jedi as having a massive stick up their asses. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ones you encounter are kind of assholes. Yeah, so. they are. They are. <laughs> oh, God. At some points, it's uh, understandable why the Sith would kill the Corellian Jedi to begin with. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, um, obviously going to lead on to the Cold War. Um, during that little escapade, Corellia would... Um, so the Corellian Jedi would, you know, stick to Corellia while the main Jedi stick to Typhon. <gasps> and they would contribute to the defense of Corellia when the Sith Empire attempted to invade and got utterly curb stomped for fucked. the destruction of the uh, Academy's Council and everything, yeah. Oof. <laughs> Fortunately, they were able to, you know, get back up to full strength at around the uh, new Sith Wars and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, in this era... Uh, the Corellian Jedi would be under the direction of a Jedi Lord. You know, the feudal lords during yeah. that era and everything. And they would become more independent than they were previously. Which is very ironic because, well, Corellia was independent to begin with, but semantics. Um, but despite this, when Lord Hoff called upon them for destroying the Sith once and for all, they swore fealty to him and the Army of Light. Mm-hmm. While many Corellian Jedi would help destroy the Sith on Rusan, they were not heralded as heroes by the High Council who turn on them, calling them dissidents and heretics. God damn. So yeah, disgusted with the Jedi High Council, um, the Jedi Lord by the name of Berfrion and his remaining Corellian Jedi would return to their homeworld and they would basically remain in total isolation for generations. They're all like, fuck you guys. We're not going to work with you anymore. We, Okay, the, the, Sith, the Sith are now extincted. And this is how, how you think us? us. <laughs> They're like, fuck you. Yeah, I would too. <laughs> Though eventually, during the last dec decades of a Republic, the, the relationship between the High Council and the Corellian Jedi would become much more amicable. With even a member of a Jedi High Council being a member of a Corellian Jedi. Hmm. 
So yeah, um, their relationship, you know, going strong once improved. again. Improved. Yeah, <laughs> very improved. Um, but they proved their loyalty to Corellia by during the Separatist Crisis. They joined their homeworld of Corellia by enacting the Contemplatus Hermony, which is basically Corellia saying, "Fuck you guys, we're not going to participate in galactic affairs. We want to remain independent in this matter." Mm-hmm. If you remember the uh, yes, Corellian episode. Um, Corellia just wanted to remain independent. Yeah, and the, and the Corellian Jedi basically joined them. Like, fuck you guys. We're going to stick with our big daddy over here. <laughs> there, were, However, there was a small schism within the Corellian Jedi who wanted to join their cousins in fighting back against the Separatists and mm-hmm. everything. And this Jedi Master and this small organization of Corellian Jedi would be led by this guy named Nigia Helcyon who reviewed the situation and decided to return to Coruscant and declare their loyalty to the Jedi High Council. Okay. Regardless of which planet they swore loyalty to, the Corellian Jedi would also be victims of a Great Jedi Purge. Oof. Yeah. That re- sucks. Yeah. The, yeah. The Galactic Empire held nothing back with either side of a Corellian Jedi. Um... While most of the Corellian Jedi perish, including Halcyon himself, some would survive, including his son, Velian Halcyon, who passed uh, his own Jedi credit to his son, Carrion Horn, who is a very important member of the uh, old EU of Star Wars. He's one of the first Jedi initiates in, in uh, Luke Skywalker's order. Mm. He was like, I believe, so he was a member of Corsac and a ace for Rogue Squadron. He was like in his 30s when he entered into the Jedi Order by this time, by the way. I mean, at least Luke is more open to adults joining yeah. the Order instead of just restricting it to children. Yeah, at this point in time, you can't be too picky with your initiates. Nope. <laughs> but yeah, one uh, carry on horn joined the new Jedi Order, and found out about his lineage, he went on to found, re-found the Corellian Jedi and keeping up the proud tradition while working closely with Luke Skywalker. Nice. Now, the next couple of organizations, they're kind of one note, but I'll go ahead and mention them anyway. Um, the Ducky Jedi. Um, I'll go ahead and send a picture of these guys, too. Uh, these guys are kind of insignificant. They, like, appear in a... This game called the Clone Wars Adventures. They're a uh, very interesting and weird looking Jedi. That lightsaber is not a lightsaber. It's a <laughs> stick. What the fuck? The Dagi Jedi are a sect of the Jedi Order that thrive on the mid-rim world of Dagi, where they wore those special tunics bearing stripes as a sign of their loyalty to the Republic and build lightsabers that held unique local crystals that produced lightsaber blades that looked like zigzagging rods with a dark silver black core, as you see in that picture there. Yeah, that's... Strange. Yeah, it's very strange. By the time of the Clone Wars, they were considered extinct, but their robes and lightsabers remained for others to plunder and use. Hmm. So basically, these guys appeared as cosmetic items, basically, oh, with shit. a lore attached to them. And uh, That's a shitty way to go. <laughs> exactly. And the next guy is also a similar case of this. The Ermi Jedi. I was, don't worry, I sent a picture to that, too. The Ermi Jedi are an in- ancient sect of the Order that hailed from the Outer Rim world of, well, Ermi, and are notable for their lightsabers that contained Mataifasa gems with stray energy tendrils spiraling off of their blades. Okay. They also wore decorative white robes with blue markings and armored plates. By the time of the Clone Wars, their lightsabers and garments were, you know, be mm-hmm. purchasable for any of the Jedi player characters. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what game? Uh, G- Clone Wars Adventures, I think it's called. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those old MMORPGs that I don't think is active right now, but just a nice little interesting piece of, uh, yeah. Yeah, you'll have to look it up sometime. Sim- very similar to Swator and Galaxies. Uh, I don't think it's active right now, but it used to exist a long, long time ago <laughs> in a galaxy far, far away. Virtual World. Yep. Release date 2010. Holy fuck. Yeah, doesn't that make you feel old? That makes me feel very old. (laughs) You can play it again. Oh, you can. Okay. Nice. Yeah. 
someone made an emulator. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. I uh, I honestly need to play uh, Star Wars Galaxies and Clone Wars I wanna Adventures. Play the, I want to play both of those too. Yeah. Anyway. A nice little facet of history. But anyway, back to the main topic of the episode. And the next sect of Jedi is actually one of my personal favorites. We will be talking about the Iron Knights. And you're probably familiar with one of its members in uh, our Star Wars alternate campaign. Is that Frickium? Well, yeah, Frickium is part of the uh, Iron Knights. That's cool. Yeah, the Iron Knights are a more unique sect of the Jedi Order, as they were made up of a sentient race called the Shard, which are the little gems within that uh, droid right there. Nice. So, to make a long story short, the Shard are basically a sentient uh, crystalline race that hail from this world of Oriox, which is known for its wondrous material formations and human colonists that uh, stumbled upon the world uh, found the local crystals, which turn out to be the shard, to be sentient. Uh-huh. And they kind of make this uh, communication device that reads their electromagnetic waves, which translates those waves to, you know, Basic. words, you know. Um, and uh, the shards, they're kind of this hive mind race where they share collective knowledge with their colonies and everything. So Frickium is part of a hive mind. He was part of a hive mind, yes. Because the shard... Uh, there are a couple of shards that once they found out about the wider galaxy, they became very curious and intrigued. And several individual shards volunteer to separate from their colonies and explore the galaxy. And how were they able to do this? They modified a couple of droids to put them in to serve as basically embodiments of their will. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. So yeah, it's it's less of a now dro- you have to have Frickium, like, expand on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's less of a droid, because it, contrary to popular belief, the Iron Knights are not droids that turn out to be Force-sensitive. No, they're they're not, like, fucking C-3PO. No, no. But Force-sensitive. Yeah. The Shards basically are piloting these uh, mech suits, so to speak. Jinx. Yeah. Um... So it's less of a droid being force sensitive and more of the individual piloting a mech suit that has magical powers, basically. Mm-hmm. And the the shards the shards are silicate based life forms. They're not organic beings, but they are still sentient, regardless. Um, Everything in fucking Star <laughs> Wars is sentient. At this <laughs> like a more fucking force sensitive porg. Yep. <laughs> Anything can be force sensitive now. Uh, yeah, in the old Legends universe of Star Wars, yes. <laughs> yeah, Le- as I've said before many, many times, Legends was on crack. Yeah, it's it's the best kind of crack though, because the more fucking Iron Knights are my personal favorite thing about Legends. Fair enough. But yeah, um, most of these shards, most of them aren't force sensitive, but there are a small member. Of them that are force sensitive. And there was this, uh, what was it? Um, okay. Yeah, there's also, I will briefly go upon the shards again. Um, this practice where the shards, you know, go off into the wider galaxy to experience these new sensations because, you know, they were always immobile their entire lives yeah. and now they have these new experiences. Um, most of the traditional shard colonies kind of saw it as a corruption of their, you know, their culture and everything. While other shards welcomed the new knowledge that their off-world cousins would bring upon them. Hmm. But yeah, um, eventually, a small number of shards would be found to be Force-sensitive, and this would be discovered by a Jedi Master named Aquinos. Um, Aquinos is kind of an interesting Jedi, he was criticized by the Order for his belief that droids are a form of sentient life and could theoretically use the Force. Well, he has a point. Yeah. Um, due to this, he was cast out by the Jedi High Council, where he found solace among our good old buddies, the Altizian Jedi. Mm-hmm. Um, and he would stumble upon this shard named Ilium. Not to be confused with the planet of Ilium. Ilum. <laughs> yeah, Ilium, she is a... Uh, 
I wish they could dive more into these characters because they sound so fascinating. Ilum, she's a uh, female shard, and she has her own small number of baby shards that she has with them who are all Force-sensitive. How the fuck do shards... (laughs) <laughs> how, how do they, they breed gendered? how do they breed <laughs> probably uh, it probably what takes a good fuck? if uh if we uh <laughs> look at granite for example it'll probably take a good while for them to have kids uh d- okay moving on <laughs> i know a lot of mind fucking over here don't worry about it fucking sentient crystals that are force sensitive and have babies <laughs> it's like what the fuck <laughs> But yeah, Aquinos would come across Ilum and her 12 children on this planet called Orax. Goddamn! And Aquinos began training them in the ways of a force, residing on the outer rim, outer rim world of Dweem. Aquinos Dweem. would play... Dweem. <laughs> I know, it's such a weird name for a, for a planet. Dweem. <laughs> oh, so is fucking Exegol. Yeah, but you know, that's fair. That's also fair. Disney is very guilty of this. Um... <laughs> But anyway, where was I? Dweem. Residing on this world, Aquinos would Dweem. place... <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Sorry, continue. Aquinos would place the 12 young shards into their own vessels, which were formed from formidable combat droids. Um, Deemed all of them fully-fledged Jedi Knights. He called this new group, well, the Iron Knights. Mm-hmm. And I, this is my own personal headcanon, but... Uh, uh, Frickium is also one of those 12 children. That's cool. It is pretty cool. And he's just going around in the galaxy, learning more about the Force and everything. I thought he was exiled from the Jedi. Yeah, he is exiled, as we'll get to in the story oh, here. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, the Iron Knights. They would make their first major appearance to the wider galaxy during an event called the Arcanian Revolution. Um, where they would actually fight alongside Mace Windu himself. Oh, shit. This was before he became the the well-known Jedi Master he's known as today. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And even though Mace Windu himself would be hailed as a hero by the wider galaxy for his actions during the revolution, the Iron Knights, they would be ostracized by the Jedi Order because they basically are a... uh, Force sensitive droids, no! <laughs> because, yeah, the Iron Knights are basically a walking. What's the word I'm looking for? A, uh. God damn it. What's a, a walking paradox for the Jedi Order? Yeah. Because, in their view, only organic beings, things that possess metachlorians, could use the Force, but. The shards, they're inorganic and they're silicon based life forms and they inhabit in organic bodies. So, why the fuck is this frog able to use the force? That should not happen. Yeah. And uh, uh, Jedi Master Aquinos, for sharing his knowledge on the force with basically rocks, mm-hmm. was excommunicated by the Jedi Order. Oh, fuck. Yeah. They were like, go to Dweem. You're exiled there forever. God damn. Yeah. That sucks. That is a very shitty situation indeed. It's a very shitty <laughs> situation. However, even though he was he and the Iron Knights were exiled to Dweem, um Supreme Chancellor Palpatine would actually grant each Iron Knight the position of High Marshal. Yeah. Which is oh. kind of meaningless, but it's a nice honorary title for them to operate in the Grand Army of the Republic during the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. And one of these motherfucking Iron Knights fought Grievous himself. And survived or died? No, he died. He, died, <laughs> he did. He did. Because it's Grievous, you know, slash slash dash stab. Um, fortunately, or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, this exile would be kind of a... Uh, a uh, Miracle in disguise because they were spared from Order 66 and everything. Oh, well, yeah, Dweem is probably. <laughs> Dweem. Dweem. Dweem is probably a backwater planet, just like Dad Dweem. No one fucking notices it. I think it's an ice planet, if I remember oh correctly. My God. <laughs> so, yeah, even more backwater than Tatooine, I imagine, yeah. Yeah, a shitty little planet in the middle of fucking nowhere. <laughs> like, oh, we don't care about that. It was fucking the Jedi Master. Oh my god, what happened to the rest of the Jedi? <laughs> well, one day, the Iron Knights would be approached by this good old chap. You probably know him as Luke Skywalker. Mm-hmm. Who was heard about the Iron Knights, and he was like, 
God damn, you guys can use the Force. That's pretty cool. Want to join my new Jedi Order? And they accepted. Well, duh. Yeah. And That's then, cool. At least yeah. You get a happy ending. Yeah. Well, Ish. kind of. Ish. Kind of. <laughs> when our good old buddies, the Yuzhang Vong, invaded? Um, yeah. Aquinos was one of the many uh, casualties of that war. Oh. So yeah, after spending 50 years founding the Iron Knights and then going to save the galaxy and all that, he ended up being killed by the Yuzhang Vong. That sucks. However, the Iron Knights, they had many heroic deeds, like protecting their fellow droids against the invaders. And some of them actually fell to the dark side and took extreme measures to go against the Yuzhang Vong. Jesus. So yeah, they do kind of have their happy ending. Some of them join the dark side. Some of them stay loyal to the light side. You know, good feels all around mm -hmm. in general. And yes, uh, for context with the audience, my uh, long-lasting NPC of Star Wars alternate, Frickium, he's an Iron Knight. He was supposed to die in the gene fight. Yeah, but uh, he's so well-liked that everybody's like, nope. Yep. <laughs> Yep, Arctic was like, no. I think I... Did I tell you the story of how the party met Frickium? I don't... I can't remember if he did or not. Okay, uh... I'll, I'll go ahead and put it here, just for context for both the audience and Hannah. Um, so this was very early in my campaign of Star Wars Alternate, before I actually called it Star Wars Alternate. <laughs> um, Frickium was basically a random droid that the, uh party was tasked by the Black Sun to capture because mm -hmm. this droid just kept appearing all over the place on uh, shipment raids and, you know, important Black Sun shipments were uh -huh. destroyed by this Force user and this droid just appeared in the background and they're like, give that droid, he might be connected to the Jedi Master. And when the uh, party members found Frickium, they were like, okay, tell us where your Jedi Master is now. And he, he was all like, you're looking, You're looking at, at him. him. <laughs> You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> That's funny. It is so funny. And now funny. he's a mainstay of the crew. He is a, a huge mainstay, and I recently got an art piece of him made after three fucking years. I can't wait to see it. I think I showed you already, but yeah. I can't remember if you did or... Oh, right, you did, you did. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> the bug droid. Yeah, the, uh, the bug droid, yeah. Um. So yeah, the Iron Knights are a personal favorite as, of mine, as you could tell fair enough <laughs> and the next organization these were all a huge mouthful holy crap <laughs> okay we're good yeah, um we're still good yeah the next organization is what is called the jedi covenant this is another old republic uh, era organization of a okay. jedi order um here we go these guys are kind of a uh antagonist slash anti-hero faction of this uh, Old Republic comic series, as you'll see. But yeah, the, the Jedi Covenant, it's a secret organization of the Jedi founded during the time of the Old Sith Wars, when uh, Exar Kun was going about blowing up stars and everything. <laughs> um, specifically, they were created by this individual named Kraya Dre, who... Is that the guy in the middle? Uh, no, it's a... Uh, of her individual I'll yeah. send you a picture of it but that's her son actually in the middle oh yeah um Lucian Dre I think his name is he's a uh, very significant character but he's not important right now <laughs> um so yeah the Jedi Covenant was created by Kernia Dre who felt that not foreseeing the darkness within Exar Kun was her failing as a Jedi Sage because Jedi Sages basically foresee foresee visions and everything like that and because they were so focused on everything else in the galaxy and not to the Jedi Order itself, mm -hmm. she felt personally responsible for that. <laughs> but yeah, um, let me see. Fuss in her bid to prevent the rise of another individual like Exar Kun to be, you know, create the Sith Order and everything, mm -hmm. she founded the Jedi Covenant whose sole mission is to use Jedi Consulars as shadows to search for shatter points that might lead to the resurrection of a Sith. Like, uh, you know what shatter points are, right? The only thing I've heard shatter point wise with uh, Star Wars is like Mace Windu's lineage is called the shatter point lineage. Okay, so to give you a quick context, shatter point is basically a philosophy on f events going on in the Force and everything. Like, Mace Windu's main ability is shatter points, which 
on a uh, individual level could mean finding weaknesses within everyday objects or any and everything like that. Or on a wider scale, a shatter point on an event or person. Like he foresaw Anakin Skywalker as a major shadow shatter point in galactic affairs. Oh, okay. So think of it like that. And for the shatter point here, it's basically keeping an eye out for individuals that might lead to the rise of a Sith. Okay. So yeah, Good to get that context out of the way. Okay, at least I understand now. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so to prevent that, the Jedi Covenant is composed of several watch circles that specialize in different types of visions. Though apart from the Seers, they also operate agents known as Shadows, where they're basically individual members of the Jedi Order that show great promise for finding dark side artifacts and all of that stuff. And... The Jedi Covenant would recruit them. So you know how like in most spy organizations, like the CIA or some somebody like that, finds these candidates and they're like, hey, you want to be our personal assassins? They're like, fuck yeah. Mm -hmm. That's basically what the shadows are. And all of their records, all of their personal information, expunged from all databases across the galaxy. And they operate as undercover agents for the Jedi Covenant. Jedi intelligence. Pretty much, yeah. But they're a lot more seedier than this, as we'll soon see. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, the Shadows are responsible for hunting numerous Sith artifacts. While they had good intentions, the Jedi Covenant would go through any lengths to prevent the rise of a Sith. And I mean any lengths. They Murder. <laughs> yeah. Um, which led to this very infamous event called the Padawan Massacre. Oh, fuck. Yeah, um, so if the first watch circle, which is the picture of individuals I shared with you, uh -huh. they, each one of them are seers. Like, they could foresee the future and all of this bullshit. Mm -hmm. However, as with most things, it could be vague. They could misinterpret the future, but each one of them saw a future where they got killed by this mysterious individual in a uh, exosuit. And they kind of interpret this individual as one of their own Padawans, because their Padawans were wearing exosuits at the time. Uh -huh. And they're like, oh my god, these people are going to fall to the dark side and murder us in the process. We gotta murder them first. And that's what led to these Jedi Masters murdering their own Padawans. Jesus Christ. Yeah, like I said, these guys would go to any lengths to prevent the rise of a Sith. And they're still Jedi. Yeah. That's... <laughs> I know. This is why I called them a anti-hero Hero. slash antagonist faction. Yeah. <laughs> we gotta protect the galaxy. Let's kill our own Padawans. Yeah, yeah. Thus, That's yeah, fucked. yeah. Um, this entire organization is important to this in this comic book series, uh, the comic book version of the Knights of the Old Republic, and the main character who is this Jedi Padawan named Zane Carrick. I'll probably talk about him one day. Huh. Um, so he's kind of a uh, interesting individual. He's kind of a uh, bumbling buffoon. He's always late to his classes and everything like that. Um, he was late to his graduation ceremony. And when he arrived, he found all of his uh, fellow Padawans dead. And the Jedi Masters were like, we're going to have to kill you next. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, run it away! <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. The fucking Naga Sadao. The Naga Sadao meme of, run away! Run away! <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I would love to talk about this character one of these days. But yeah, despite, <laughs> you know, being very, uh, you know, um... Wanting to stop the rise of a Sith and everything. Ultimately, their goals are for nothing. Because, well, Darvishiot's Jedi... Not Jedi. Darvishiot's Sith Empire already existed in the Yondo regions of the time. Yup. Yeah. Sucks to suck. Sucks to suck. That's why Sith are better. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Jedi Covenant are kind of... Interesting, quote-unquote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... But yeah, they didn't last for too long, obviously. We're almost done. We're almost done. Don't worry. <laughs> Next are the cool guys. You probably remember them as the Jedi Temple Guard. Oh, right, right, right. They're the guys with a mask and a double blade of lightsabers. They, they do look really cool. They are really kick-ass. 
They were first introduced in a later season. They are seasons. kick ass and they yeah. can kick ass. <laughs> yeah, the Jedi Temple Guard are the basically the security force of a Jedi Order, who are tasked with the protection of a Jedi Temple on Coruscant. And the Jedi Temple Guard was seen as an ancient and honor tradition, as the Temple Guards were made up of Jedi Knights randomly selected to become anonymous sen- sentinels. Yeah, that's why they wear the masks. Yeah. And as part of their lifetime commitment to the Order. And they are regarded as the best fighters within the Jedi Order. Yeah, if only the Grand Inquisitor had stuck to that. (laughs) So you already know the the most infamous member of the Jedi Temple Guard. Yeah, Yeah, the the Grand Inquisitor is kind of a cool villain in all honesty. I need to fucking watch Rebels! (laughs) But yeah, the... It's kind of interesting because, of course, they wear formal robes and the mask, which kind of gives them a sense of mysteriousness and yeah, secretive. Yeah, you don't know who it is. Yeah, you don't know who is behind that motherfucking mask. Even their own lightsabers are... They're yellow. And, well, yeah, they're yellow. They're, each one of their lightsabers is assigned to them out of anonymity. That's cool. So, yeah, as we mentioned in the lightsaber episode, each lightsaber is unique to that individual Jedi. So it makes sense that they would be assigned their own unique lightsabers and everything. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm just imagining, like, a, there's just a storeroom with many different lightsabers with their own kyber crystals. And these initiates are all like... Hey, how about stop going to Ilum? Can we have one of those kick-ass lightsabers? Like, no, you can't have that. <laughs> I really want the yellow lightsabers. No, you can't have that. It's like, no, it's, it belongs to a temple guard. Which <laughs> one? How, why the fuck would I tell you? <laughs> yeah, I do believe a appearance with Tor as well. I would have to focus more on don't worry i'll share a picture (laughs) i'll share a picture of what they look like because this is what the uh temple guard look like in sutor if it'll uh go through there it goes there oh okay i've seen a cartel market uh outfit that i put Mm -hmm. on my could have been on my consular, but I might might have put it on my night. All right. But uh, it kind of the mask of it kind of looks like uh, the temple the, guard. Yeah, the temple guard. Yeah. But it's like exiled Padawan or something. Okay. But yeah, they do appearance with Tor. I'm not sure exactly where. I think it's one of the later expansions. But yeah, they're they're presidents with Tor. Um, Never knew that. <laughs> yeah, you learn something new every day, Anna. I know, right? Um, but yeah, the temple guard. Uh. Yeah, even though they're pretty kick-ass, that wasn't enough to save a Jedi Order from Order 66. Wah, wah. Wah, wah. There's even, I recall a individual story where there was this random temple guard that was just chilling out on the steps of a Jedi temple and then Anakin Skywalker marched up with a 501st and the temple guard was just confused. And he's like, like, what the fuck? He was all like, he turned to Anakin who walked up to him and he's like, Anakin Skywalker before Anakin Skywalker just stabbed him. Of course. Fucking, that's, that's a shitty way to, it's like, yeah. Skywalker? Duh! <laughs> <laughs> like, one of their greatest members just went up. They, these guys, they are supposed to be emotionally disconnected, but by the mere fact that they were taken by surprise from one of their very own betraying them does say a lot of Anakin's betrayal of a Jedi Order. Yep. But yeah, of course we know the most infamous member, which is the Grand Inquisitor. Yep. Who was present when Beres Afe was talking about the uh, corruption of a Jedi Order and everything. I think I've seen uh, theories. It's like someone pointing out like one of the temple guards yeah. of the four that were escorting her. Uh-huh. It's like, which one's the Grand Inquisitor? Which one is it? But yeah, it's, he is among one of those guys. Okay. <laughs> so that's, yeah, he, that's a cool little detail though. Yeah, it's a, obviously I'm not sure if Dave Filoni fought that far, but it's nice to think back on. It's Dave Filoni. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Temple guard, super cool. Not too much on them. Just thought I'd include them real quickly. And then, of course, the next is the Lost Twenty. You probably are familiar with the Lost Twenty. Yes. 
Dugu being Dugu's one of them. One of them. <laughs> yeah, the laws 20, or originally they were just called the laws, were Jedi masters who had voluntary, voluntarily resigned from the Jedi Order over ideological differences. One of the earliest members of the Laws 20 was an Umbaran Jedi Master named Phonius, who eventually became the infamous Sith Lord Darth Ruin. Darth Ruin? Yeah. Hmm. So, it should have been a red flag when Count Dooku left the Jedi Order, but hindsight 2020, I suppose? Yep. <laughs> but yeah, um... Dooku was technically the most recent member of the Lost, though... It, after Order 66, Darth Vader considered himself to be the 21st member of a Lost. Wow, he still... That's funny that, you know, he fucking destroyed the Jedi Order, but still considered himself something that the Jedi originally thought of. And he fought himself a master. Egotistical <laughs> motherfucker. That motherfucking meme. You're on this council, but we don't grant you the rank of master. <laughs> Yep. He's like, who's a master now, bitch? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. He's um, still not a fucking master. No, he is not. As much as he likes to believe he is. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, final ones for you. You probably recognize uh, the Revenus. The Revenus? The Revenus, yeah. Oh. Who are the Jedi that followed Revan during the Mandalorian Wars? Yeah, the Revenkist. The Revenkist. There are different pronunciations Shit. I've heard. But uh, they're, they're also called the Jedi Crusaders. Okay, that makes it easier. Yeah, I'll just call them Crusaders for now. Um, yeah, pretty self-explanatory. They're basically a bunch of young Jedi that joined Revan and Malak to fight off the Mandalorian Fred while yep. the rest of a boomer Jedi were See like, the Revan episode. Yeah, it's very good explanation. But yeah, they basically fought alongside the, the military faction of the Republic became their commanders for sensitive allies and all of that shit. And unfortunately, when the Mandalorian Wars was won, they joined uh, Revan and Malag on the dark side, becoming Sith Lords. Of course. Yeah, interestingly enough, there were a couple members of the Jedi Crusaders that saw Revan taking a much more casual approach to the dark side. And they're like, no, we don't like, want any no. part of that. No, <laughs> this is some... Bad voodoo shit. We're out of here. That's bad juju. And uh, there were also a couple of spies sent to the Crusaders by the High Council to keep tabs on Revan and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pretty simple. But let me uh, leave you off with this quote about the uh, Jedi Crusaders. <clears throat> Several years ago, when the Mandalorian threat first arose... Revan and Malak were eager to journey to the Outer Rim to defeat the army, the, the enemy of the Republic. But the Council felt it best if we moved with care and caution. The true threat, the Council feared, had not yet revealed itself. But Revan would not be dissuaded. Charismatic and powerful, it was inevitable many of the Order would flock to Revan's seemingly noble cause. Malak was the first to join his closest friend. Others soon followed. Many of our youngest and brightest intent on saving the galaxy from the Mandalorian threat. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very, very, very simple. But I thought I'd just throw them in just to complete the list and everything. That's cool. But yeah, that's all I have for different organizations and sects of a Jedi Order. Yeah, that, I learned more than I thought. Yeah. I, mean, I knew the Green Jedi were a thing. I knew the Rubbing Kists were a thing. Uh-huh. Uh, the rest, though, I did not know. Yeah. Uh, and, and the Temple Guard. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. But the Temple Guard, they're technically qualified as their own separate organization. I like to think of them as, like, the, uh... They're, like, an extension of the Jedi. Yeah, I like to think of them as, like, the secret service of a Jedi Order. Almost. Yeah. Which one would have to be your favorite, by the way? Uh... I think the Jedi Temple Guard. Yeah, they... Because of the cool masks? Uh, not because of <laughs> that. Yeah. Their lightsabers are cool. They are very cool, yes. And the anon the anonymity behind them. Yeah. It's like, you don't know who it is. I remember... Do you remember that one episode where uh, Yoda was about to leave a medical facility and the Temple Guards told him, no, you can't go anywhere, old man. <laughs> and Anakin was the one who was all like, don't worry, I'll keep an eye on him. 
Yeah, they had the balls to say no to the Grandmaster himself. Yeah. That's very ballsy. <laughs> yeah. What was your favorite? I think it's pretty obvious. Oh, I right. A... The fucking Iron Knights. <laughs> I have uh, Marfucking. They appear in the new essential guide to droids. And alongside the Annihilator droid, I have a special... Um, it holds a special place in your heart. It holds a special place in my heart, yeah. That's one of the main reasons why I introduced Freaky. I was wondering cafe. why you had that book out. Yeah, let me actually give you a uh, a nice little quote from the Iron Knights real quickly, if I could uh, find them. Okay. I take no orders from you, so before I lob off your head, I have one question. Be ya friend or foe to the Republic? Oh, wow. Yeah, these guys are... Charismatic Knights to the Republic. That's cool. But yeah, I think I also like the the uh, Autrizian Jedi. Autrizian? I'll just call them Autistic Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> because I do like the aspect that they're just, you know, emulating the old ways of a Jedi and have actual familial ties and everything. I just think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. That is pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, that is our episode of Can Mayonnaise Kill a Jedi? Or in this case, oh my god, how many Jedi can there possibly be in the galaxy? Yup. <laughs> Just as much as fucking Sith Orders. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. At least the Jedi are somewhat unified in their cause. Whereas the Not Sith... Not really! Well, I mean, okay, compared to the Sith who are backstab murder orgies for days. Fair. <laughs> But yeah, um, you want to know what our next episode is going to be about, Hannah? I was just about to ask you. I think you already know this one. But our next episode will be a little more grim, a little more sci uh, a column of beautiful. We will be talking about Odran. Oh, cool. Oh, boy. <laughs> we all know how this one ends. Yeah, spoiler alert. If you haven't seen New Hope, you already know what happens to Odoran. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Can Mayonnaise Kill a Jedi, where we did indeed talk about Jedi. Um, But yeah, hope you have a wonderful day, and happy Allos Eve to the rest of ya. Happy Halloween. Happy Samhain. Love you guys. Bye. May the force be with you, or may the Schwartz be with you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.